the September international break approaches, and there's a lot going on in CONCACAF. So there's a lot to talk about. We're going to get right to it. This is the World of CONCACAF podcast. Hello and welcome to the World of CONCACAF podcast. I am Eric Schmitz. I am Donald Wine. And I'm Jonathan Slate. And we were able to get through that introduction a lot smoother this time. Uh, <laughs> we're here to talk about what's been going on in CONCACAF, and there's a lot going on in CONCACAF. Um, World Cup qualifying is coming up. Uh, the international transfer market is on fire. Uh, yeah, World Cup qualifying is right around the corner. And... I- and on top of all that, we have a laser focus this week. Oh, oh yeah, that too. We'll, we got a lot to get to. I feel like this episode is what we've been training for. So this is, you know, eighth laser focus, I think 10th episode. But this is what we have trained for since we started. The Ocho is here. The final round of CONCACAF World Cup qualifying is here for the men. I, I mean, and, and, and this is what we all live for. I think it is appropriate that episode number eight is coming at the start of the Ocho, or the Octagon, the or whatever you want to call the final stage of CONCACAF World Cup qualifying. I'm ready. I, I this, is, this is exactly what we're here to do. Let's get right to it. Okay, let's get to it then. Uh, we'll start off with the CONCACAF Newswire. Uh, lots of stuff going on, so let's cover it all. Uh, Donald, first things first, huge, huge CONCACAF news on the women's side as it looks like the tournaments are changing a little bit. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, so they kind of have revamped what was the women's championship into uh, and kind of branded it CONCACAF W. Uh, So they have two championships now. One is the W championship. Talk about that in a second. The other is the W Gold Cup, which is a new competition that will take place in 2024. But let's start with the W championship because that is the one that's really important. It serves as World Cup qualifying, Olympic qualifying, and also for one team, Gold Cup qualifying. I'll explain how it's going to work very briefly. I did break it down on episode 58 of the Stars and Stripes FC podcast from a U- from a United States perspective. So like and subscribe. More, <laughs> like and subscribe. Uh, so if you want more on the U.S. side of things, go over there and listen to that. But this is going to focus on just the general structure. So basically qualifiers – begin this fall so we're we're not we're not waiting for this the world cup qualifying is going to begin almost immediately however for the u.s and canada they are already through by result of being the top two ranked CONCACAF team so they go all the way through to the w championship so they don't have to suffer through qualifying six teams would join them through qualifiers which will take place in november and then april of 2022 and as i mentioned the w championship which is where this qualification will take place will be next summer. So we are less than 10 months away from the beginning of World Cup qualifying if you are a fan of the United States or Canada's women's national teams. So the structure is similar to what it was before. Two groups of four, and the top two from each group advance to the knockout stage. This is where it changes. Those four teams at that point have qualified for the 2023 World Cup. There is no... The, the group stage usually fit, yielded the knockout stage, and the knockout stage was the, who, what determined who was going to the World Cup. That is over. Once you make it out of the group stage, you are in the World Cup. So congratulations to those four teams already. They will, get, they will make it to the World Cup. The change will be the knockout stage will determine Olympic qualifying. The winner of the entire tournament will qualify for the 2024 Olympics, and they get an automatic spot in the 2024 Gold Cup. The runner-up and the third-place winner will qualify for a playoff, which takes place in September 2023. That will determine the second Olympic spot, and that winner will also go to the 2024 Gold Cup. So that was a little bit convoluted, but the, the basic breakdown is this. Whoever wins the tournament can qualify for three tournaments at the same time. The World Cup, 
the Olympics and the W Gold Cup. So guys, looking at that, what it used to be where it was, you know, two or three teams that ended up making the World Cup or the Olympics. Now you have four teams making it and all you have to do is really win one or two games in your group. What do you guys think about that? I, I don't like it. I mean, I, 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 want yeah, more I, games. I, I want more games that matter. And I think that we've seen um, how important Nations League has been for a lot of these CONCACAF comp- countries as far as getting more experience and getting more like playing meaningful games. And so like to condense everything into one qualification tournament for so many different things, I feel it really takes away from um, a lot of these nations getting more time and more experience playing meaningful games because, you know, as we've talked about in all these laser focus episodes, there's so many of these countries that, you know, their women's national team is just getting started and needs to play more games. And so I just don't see how break, like putting it and condensing it down to one qualification tournament is, is better. Yeah. And I mean, you see the impact of the expanded women's world cup where CONCACAF being one of the stronger confederations gets, a handful of bids um for me though one of the things that has made me like fall in love with international soccer is the magic of world cup qualifying and how it's this long process to build up to this huge event every four years and the fact there's gonna be two teams that have to win one maybe only one game maybe two games to get a bid to the world cup it's really frustrating just because you don't get that process. You don't get that like long-term engagement. Like for the at least for the US, and I know the Canadian women's national team as well suffer from this. There aren't a lot of meaningful games you play. It's a lot of friendlies against good competition. But the fact they're gonna get sent to a tournament next summer and only need two good games to get into the World Cup. I think it's not great for the confederation. It's not great for any of the teams, whether they get in or not, because there just really isn't the process to build towards an event of this magnitude. So I think for me, I agree with you both in one sense. I think for the fans of the U S and Canada, this is terrible because again, you only, we like that process. We live, we just told you we live for that process and we're not going to get one. But for those federations and for those players, they're probably thinking, cool, we'll do these two games, we'll massacre a couple of teams, and we can get back to focusing on playing some of the bigger, you know, the better teams in the world. I think the process where the process lies is in those other 33 or so nations that have to go through qualifying. They have to go through the entire W championship without necessarily knowing whether or not they're going to make it. I think that is where that process is. So for two teams, there will be a long enduring process to qualify for the W championship and then make it. It's just for the United States and Canada at this point, as as I mentioned, they're already through, so they don't have to worry about it. And then next summer, they just have to prep their teams for the first two games of the group stage. Voila, they're in the, they're in the, the world cup. But I think where it, where it does get a little bit interesting is that, the knockout stage will be used to determine Olympic qualifying. So that may be where the challenges lie for those two teams. Yeah. I just think there, there's a disconnect between the top two teams, the U S and Canada and the rest of CONCACAF. And this does nothing to bridge that gap. Like you need the U S and Canada to have to play road games in CONCACAF. Like the U S women's national team has not played a game outside of North America in CONCACAF, like on the road in decades like it's been over a decade since the, i think the last time they played outside of canada there was a concaf championship in mexico mm-hmm. a while back like i think that was the 20 for the 2011 world cup and they lost that and they had to go to a playoff with italy to get to that world cup yeah and we see it on the men's side as well like away and away games in concaf is a great leveler like, you know, there's a massive talent gap between the top teams in CONCACAF and the bottom teams. And you need away games to really bridge that more. And you're not challenging your top teams, which, I mean, Canada just won the gold in the Olympics. U.S. is the reigning World Cup champions. Like, you're doing, you're, you're taking home all the hardware you need to. But is it really helping the greater good of the confederation? I don't know. Yeah. 
I think it remains to be seen how that will work. But uh, one thing I did want to quickly touch on is the gold cup, because I think that'll be a format mm-hmm. that we kind of like, especially the road to the CONCACAF W gold cup, which basically is taking the format of the nation's league and ter- turning that into qualification for that particular tournament. So there's a group stage, 33 teams split into three leagues, league a, B and C league. A will have three groups of three. This is all determined by CONCACAF world cup qual. I'm uh, sorry, by FIFA world rankings, league B, uh, three groups of four league C three groups of four. And this is where it gets interesting. And I think there's a part of this that I think we all will hate for CONCACAF. And I'll explain in a minute. Three League A group winners, they qualify for the W Gold Cup. They go straight through. The runners up from League A and the three League B group winners, they go to a play-in to determine the final three spots from CONCACAF. So there are 12 teams in this Gold Cup field. You're probably thinking, yo, where are these 12 teams? You have the two Olympic qualifiers. You have the three League A group winners, the three winners of the play-in, and four teams from outside CONCACAF. I think that's where a lot of people are going to be upset because it's not providing four teams from CONCACAF an opportunity to be in this Gold Cup. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I I definitely think that. I just want to see CONCACAF on the women's side get stronger, and I feel like some of these... I mean, I think the Gold Cup is going to go a long way, but I mean, I... I want to I want to get to the point where we see like Eric talked about like where we see the US having to go away and play away qualifiers and I think that will just be a, a great leveler for a lot of teams. Yeah, the one thing I do like about the W Gold Cup which W Gold Cup long overdue. You need this signature event for the confederation. You need it to matter and for it to matter you have to start doing it. Um but having these guest teams I think could actually help fill the gap between the top teams, the U.S. and Canada, and the rest of CONCACAF, because you can find teams from other confederations who are going to give competitive games to the teams on the bottom end of your group. And while it may not, I don't know if you want to bring in your Englands, your Frances, your Swedens, but if you bring in the right the right level of national teams from other confederations. I think that gives you good competitive games for the countries at the bottom end of that qualifying group. Yeah. I definitely think it does no good to bring in like those top teams because it's just, then it's just going to become that, that the top, it's just going to be us, England, Sweden, Canada, or something like that. I mean, it, the main concern is you don't want anyone from outside the Confederation winning your Confederation tournament. So you got to keep that in mind. There's two things that I'm going to remain open to and see how they take it. The first thing is, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of top teams that come to this initial W Gold Cup because it's right on the heels of the 2024 Olympics. And I think a lot, as we've seen before, a lot of teams don't want to, you know, they want to have morale boosters and they're not going to get any by playing the United States or Canada right before they may see them in the Olympics. So we may not see some of those top teams from Europe or other confederations in this tournament. However, one thing I think would be interesting to do if you do involve some of these bigger teams is not playing this one in the United States. And I know they're going to probably start in the United States, but having these teams play elsewhere, Mexico, Panama, the 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 windward islands like those sort of things the west indies this will really be a boon to all the teams and level the playing field by putting it outside the united states absolutely so more details on that uh the new women's competitions as we get closer uh let's move on in the newswire here uh jonathan what's going on in jamaica so Jamaica, you know, we've talked on this podcast many times about, you know, the work that Jamaica is doing in recruiting dual national players, specifically the dual national players um, located in England, not in, just in the Premier League, but in throughout the leagues in in England. Well, it's time for World Cup qualifying, which means it's time to qualify to, to name a roster and which every team has named a roster, but Jamaica. Um, So Jamaica is in a situation and I'm just going to read this statement from uh, the JFF uh, on Twitter. 
Uh, it says, we need your voice to rise up in unison. We need you to call on the British government to relax quarantine measures so we can have our best team on the field. We need every single player. Give us our boys. Let's go, Jamaica. No quarantine. Qatar, we say. So Jamaica is in a situation where England has uh, what they categorize as red countries. Um, and any person that travels to a red country has to quarantine for 10 days. Well, because of the, having to quarantine for 10 days upon return, um, they're not required. The English FA is not required to release players. And so it's not just a Jamaica thing here. I mean, it's specifically impacting Jamaica, but um, we're seeing all, all throughout the leagues, you know, players in South America aren't being allowed to go to games because upon their return, they're going to have to quarantine for 10 days and, and, and miss, uh, miss games. So I really hope that, you know, Jamaica is able to get this squared away, but it doesn't look like it. And as terrible as it is, it's just something that we're still going to have to deal with um, in the, in the age of COVID. So hopefully it's only just this window. Um, and it's not a situation where we find ourselves at the end of the, uh, the Ocho or the octagonal going, man, what would a Jamaica look like if they had all these players? Yeah. And now this UK, just to clarify, UK has put together this red list of countries based on COVID. Um, so what they identify as hotspots, um, they have travel restrictions in place. So you're supposed to quarantine on the way back. This does affect some CONCACAF countries, but not all of them. When it comes to World Cup qualifying, the key countries who are affected by this, first of all, it's Costa Rica, second, Mexico, third, Panama, and I believe it's just those three. Yep. Yeah, so How it's the U.S. doesn't countries. make that list blows my mind. Yes, the U.S., <laughs> not on that list, even though we are the absolute worst right now when it comes to COVID. So shout out UK for not not worrying about us too much. Um, but with those three countries on the list, Jamaica, their, this upcoming window, and we'll talk more about this later when we cover qual qualifying, uh, they travel to Mexico, they travel to Costa Rica. So they're going to two red list countries in this window specifically. So as of now, we still don't have an answer on this, um, but definitely a concern for, as far as the competitive aspect of uh this window and qualifying goes and this can all change this is as of right now as we record because uh you know down the line as you mentioned you know this is not just based on covid cases because if it was there's no reason why the united states would not be on the red list it has to do with vaccinations and other other metrics that they have of which we uh, you know compared to the rest of the world are actually doing better at so that could all change. Some of these countries could come off the list next month, but next month for the United States, they travel to Panama and that would be an issue for their Premier League players if Panama remains on the red list. Also, it will be an interesting issue if the United States does get added to this because, of course, we would have two games in the United States. So that'll be an issue that I think, as you guys mentioned, all of these teams are going to have to experience. Yeah, it's, it's just very much going to be a, a moving target throughout throughout qualifying and, and throughout this whole process, because um, as much as some people want to think that it's all over, um, we're still going to be dealing with this uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Just get vaccinated. Yeah. yeah. On behalf get vaccinated, of vaccinated, wear your mask, wash your hands. Yeah. On behalf of the podcast, our policy is get your ass vaccinated ASAP. If you or your shoulder. I mean, if you want to put it in your ass, that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever gets the damn shot in you. <laughs> Um, all right, so moving on, uh, a little bit lighter news. Uh, Jonathan, what's going on with El Salvador? So I believe we touched on this um, when it first happened. So set stage, um, El Salvador has extended their deal with um, Umbro to 2026. Um, so great news to see El Salvador um, having someone you know sponsoring their jerseys. Hold Let's on one second. One second. I just want to say, hey, Umbro. Send us some gear. We'll, yes. we'll rock it. Yeah, I got people I, here. I got people here in D.C. Yeah, 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 especially Donald. Don being in D.C. with everybody in El Salvador, or all the El Salvadorans. Uh, but yeah, so 2026, um, they signed that deal. So great for the team. I was maybe hoping for 
let's be honest, El Salvador's crest is a little boring or what they wear on the jersey. They just wear an ES. Yeah, uh, I think it's great, personally. It's my initials. It's my, uh, my squad. <laughs> so, I mean, we've seen some of the fire that some of the other CONCACAF teams are, are putting out there. So, um, But, I mean, it's a nice, clean, classic look. Definitely the thing classic. that this got, we saw, first saw a look at their new jerseys, and I think we touched on this on the pod. Yeah, um, we touched which, on this, but remind us. Uh, so I'm just going to remind you, uh, just a CONCACAF moment. Um, there was a shipment of El Salvador jerseys that came in through the U.S. Uh, that Border Patrol in Cincinnati seized, shared on Twitter, uh, and said it was all counterfeit Umbro apparel. Well, turns out it wasn't. Turns it was out real. it was the <laughs> unreleased Umbro stuff. And like Border Patrol put those pictures out on Twitter. So um, Umbro was not happy by the fact that um, their new jerseys for El Salvador were being uh, released and unveiled um, when Border Patrol thought they were uh, were fake. Um, I do just want to point out that um, this was done by Cincinnati Border Patrol. Um, so um, if we need any more reason not to like ohio um (laughs) this is uh this we can add this to the pile Um, listen it it was good viral marketing for them yeah exactly okay so congrats to el salvador on getting those that clean look extended to 2026 so they'll be wearing umbro for the foreseeable future uh just a quick note injury note uh trinidad and tobago international uh kevin molino with the Columbus crew in MLS uh, out nine to 12 months. He's going to undergo undergo ACL reconstruction on his right knee. Um, so it looks like he's going to miss the start of nation's league next year. So tough news for Trinidad. Uh, and then one more note on the newswire, uh, Jonathan, big dual national news. Yeah. So I've big dual national news, Ricardo Pepe of the, FC Dallas, not the FC Dallas, of FC Dallas. <laughs> um, dual national, uh, eligible to represent both the United States and Mexico, had represented the U.S. at the youth national team levels. Um, I know we'd previously touched on the fact that, you know, we've seen David Ochoa choose to represent Mexico uh, and filing that one-time switch. But Ricardo Pepe has chosen to represent the United States and finds himself on the roster for World Cup qualifying. Um, it is important to note that even if he does play, um, he could potentially still switch, um, but he would have to wait three years. Uh, he would not be able to switch until after this cycle due to the fact some some changes in the uh, eligibility requirements and age with him being a du- dual national able to, to represent both countries. But um, big news, though, with, with Pepe choosing to uh, represent the United States. We do know there's still a few other dual nationals, probably the biggest one being Julian Araujo, who's yet to choose uh, which CONCACAF nation he is going to represent. Um, but I think that it's big news for the United States, uh, especially as we you know get into World Cup qualifying. We love dubs. We love dubs over Mexico, especially. Uh, but this kid is also <laughs> just a tremendous talent. I think he's going to be a, a guy that will compete to be one of those strikers that we see for here on out. He's 18 years old. We could see him in a U.S. men's national team uniform for the next 15 years, uh, which if you think about it is just incredible. So I really am happy that he is in this camp and looking forward to seeing him on the field. Yeah, I mean, I think what you've seen in you reference the Ochoa decision earlier, um, and I mean, there's dual nationals all over CONCACAF that this, is, this isn't a – a one-time thing where there's going to be all of a sudden people deciding like this is a constant, constant discussion. Um, But the one thing I think you noticed with the Ochoa decision going for Mexico and now Pepe choosing the U S you have to assume it's kind of impacted by the depth charts for those national teams. Uh, Ricardo Pepe definitely has a path to play a lot for the U S national team. And I don't think Ochoa had a chance to get many minutes in goal. Uh, but Pepe, I mean, he could, this could be huge. Like if you look at the U S national team of late, there really aren't enough Mexican American players involved. And Pepe has a chance to be 
a top guy and a star. One important note about the cap tie rules, as Jonathan was mentioning, he mentioned that if he gets into a game, he can't represent Mexico for three years and U S would have to not call him in those three years, but also on the flip side, he needs four appearances to be fully cap tied to the United States. So those of you who are fans of the U S national team do not, I repeat, do not panic that he is not going to be cap tied at all in this window. Like that is impossible for him to be fully cap tied in these three matches because he needs four, the simple math. So even if he appears in all three, he will not be cap tied. There is no worry as of this point. Ricardo Pepe is one of us. He's one of the United States, and he is not planning on making that switch anytime soon. All right, and that co- wraps up our CONCACAF Newswire. Uh, up next, we're going to do our CONCACAF Laser Focus. This episode, we're going to talk about Aruba. So we'll be right back. We are back. It is time for the CONCACAF laser focus, the central piece of every episode of the World of CONCACAF podcast. This episode, we are talking about Aruba. Gentlemen, have we been to Aruba? I have. You I have. have not. You have not. I have not. So, Donald, tell us about Aruba. Yeah, so let me give you a little bit of the history. Aruba is what we call a constituent country of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. It was formerly part of the Dutch Antilles, but now has the formal name as a country. Uh, It forms the ABC Islands, if you're looking on a map, with Bonaire and Curaçao. It's just right off the tip of Venezuela in the southern part of the Caribbean. So the one thing that is unlike the rest of the Caribbean is that Aruba's climate is pretty dry. They even have cacti on the islands. It's one of those arid climates that is unlike most of the Caribbean. You're thinking in the Caribbean, you're getting hot, you're getting oppressive humidity, You're going to get heat in Aruba, but you don't get a lot of that humidity. And their beaches are absolutely gorgeous, which is why a lot of people flock there. It's, of course, tourism, as many of these countries are here in the Caribbean. Tourism is their number one industry. The reason why, they have a great climate. They have incredible beaches, and the people there are fantastic. The island itself is is fairly small. It has a population of 116,000 or so. Uh, The capital and largest city is Orangistad, which translates to Orange City. Uh, but Aruba is basically one third, the population of Aruba is about one third of the population of the Dutch Caribbean. We've talked about Curacao. It also includes St. Martin and the Caribbean Netherlands, which is Bonaire, Saba, and St. Eustatius. Um, much like the rest of the Caribbean, uh, the first settlers were actually Spanish. Well, one was Italian Spanish. You may know him. His name is Americo Vespucci. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, that guy. Um, He discovered it along with Alonso de Ojeda in 1499. There were already natives there, uh, but the Spanish obviously took them over. And then de Ojeda uh, became Aruba's first governor. The Thirty Years' War saw the Dutch take control from Aruba, and they've had it ever since, with the exception of a 10-year window during the Napoleonic Wars where the British took control and then, through a treaty, gave it back to Aruba. It got its autonomy in 1983. Again, it's now a country. While uh, it, while I said it was a very arid climate and very dry, it does get rain. It's just not very much. So they have a few days where it does get wet. They get under 18 inches of rain on average per year. And most years come up well short of that. It also is in kind of a little cone that makes it where it's not really prone to hurricanes. So if you like, not go, if you like going to islands and sitting there and not having to worry about the weather, Aruba is your place. Of course, the official language of Aruba is the Dutch. Uh, Papiamento, the Dutch Creole that is spoken throughout the Dutch Antilles is also an official language, but you all will find plenty of people who speak English because of the tourism, which is this dominant industry. Soccer is a very popular sport, but the most popular sport is baseball. Of course, if you've watched the Major League Baseball and other, you know, the Caribbean World Series and stuff like that, 
you'll see a bunch of a Rubens uh, or, or former Rubens uh, applying their trade in the United States. Xander Bogarts for you Boston Red Sox fans out there is from Aruba. Um, Aruba also, if you watch Little League World Series, Aruba normally has a team that makes it to Williamsport just about every year. They won it all in 2010. So they're very on the minds of people who are playing, playing or watching baseball. Aruba is the country that they think of when they talk about the Caribbean. Uh, in addition to that, in soccer, diving, basketball, and kiteboarding are popular places, uh, popular uh, things to do. Wait, what's kiteboarding? Kiteboarding is you literally have a kite and you have a surfboard and you surf with a kite. It's called kiteboarding. <laughs> have you I, ever seen this, kiteboarding? It sounds it, complicated. I, I live in Tennessee. How where am I going to see kiteboarding? On TV, like on I TV, do. yeah, everywhere. <laughs> like, what channel um, shows kiteboarding? I, I'm assuming NBC <laughs> Sports after uh, a uh, after a Premier League game. It's, it's ESPN probably... eight the Ocho uh, since <laughs> episode eight. So um, I think that's on Peacock. It's on Peacock, yes. Um, to finish up here, the national beer is Balashi, and the rum there is Palmera. That's one of the rums. But they have a unique liqueur, and it's called Kokoi. It's spelled C-O-E-C-O-E-I. Kokoi, which is a crimson liquor. It forms the base of one of Aruba's oldest and most popular drinks. The Aruba Ariba is made with Kokoi Vodka 151, creme de banana, and a combo of orange, cranberry, and pineapple juices. Very, very good drink. I highly recommend you try it. But the thing about Kokoi is that it's not exported. The only place you can really get it is on the island. So next time you travel to Aruba, make sure you bring home a bottle and make sure you bring home a second bottle for the World <laughs> of CONCACAF podcast. Other things that are cool to get in Aruba, cigars, stamps if you collect them, hot sauce. Uh, they have a, and they have an empanada snack that's called a patichi, which is uh, it's a national snack. It's an empanada basically. And it's filled with a savory filling of some sort, like turkey, uh, tuna, beef, cheese, or chicken. Uh, so those are the things that you can get in Aruba. But again, the main thing is if you're looking for something unique, Cocoa is your thing. And also Cocoa is our thing. So please send us a box. I, and I'll, I'll make this plea to the uh, Aruban uh, tourism board. <laughs> um, I do love a good hot sauce. I mean, I, mean, I yes. love Cocoa as well. So um if it's easier just to mail me a bunch of hot sauce, I'll, I'll take that as well. Yeah, the hot sauce there is in, if you've been to the Caribbean, you know that their hot sauces can tend to get pretty spicy. A Reuben, a Reuben hot sauce is hot, not spicy, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a peppery type of deal. It has, it has heat, like, like, like temperature heat, but it's not spicy like you would think spicy food, right? So there's a little bit of difference. It, it, because of that, they're able to pack a lot of flavor into it. So a lot of their hot sauces have some distinct flavors to it. Sounds delicious. Um, definitely gonna have to get down to Aruba to check that stuff out. Uh, thanks for the info, Donald. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about the soccer in Aruba, because this is the podcast about the soccer. Uh, Aruba, they've had soccer for years and years. Um, the Rubans football bond the aruba football federation was founded in 1932 uh they didn't get affiliated with fifa quite until 1988 um they've got a nice league system set up there uh there's actually three divisions there is the division de honor which is your top division and then below that uh division uno and the division dos uh the avb also runs uh women's league the division damas and uh, junior in for the under 20 teams. Uh, also, since 2005, the AVB has operated the Torneo Copa Petico Cross, which is like the cup competition. Um, that actually includes the men's teams from all three divisions. Uh, so that gets operated every year. Uh, unfortunately, they really haven't had, they haven't been able to get their leagues back up and running full speed since COVID hit. Uh, their 1920 season was suspended, and they've run a couple competitions. They had the Torneo Copa Betico Cross this summer, um, but they haven't really established the full league yet. All the teams aren't back playing yet, but soccer is thriving a little bit on the island. Um, we do want to talk about the national teams. Jonathan, why don't you start with the women's national team of Aruba? Yeah, so I think we've kind of talked about this for a lot of uh these CONCACAF nations. Ad nauseum. <laughs> um, 
the women's team is not has not been around for a long time. So they're currently ranked uh, 165th. Um, the highest we have seen them rank was they made it up to 92nd in 2009, and they're currently at their lowest. So they didn't play their first international game until May of 2006. So like a lot of these countries, uh, not a very long history. Uh, you know, 15, it's been, you know, only been around for 15 years. Um, their biggest win came in 2018. Um, they got a 2-1 win over Anguilla, um, our, you know, I would say the the official team of the pod. Our uh, boys. Our bo- our, our, or our, our girls in, in uh, Anguilla. Mm-hmm. Um, biggest defeat coming in 2015, where they suffered a, a pretty humiliating 14-0 loss. Um to uh to haiti so they they have yet to qualify for a, or a world cup um and have not qualified um for a, a Concacaf women's championship so uh have not been in those um they did make some 2016 olympic qualifiers but of course did not qualify so um a very short history but one um, that we feel that, you know, as we touched on with the Gold Cup stuff, um, with the, the W Gold Cup, hopefully we see this, uh, you know, this team continue to do better. Yeah, for sure. On the men's side, now the men's team, because of Aruba's history, uh, they were actually part of the Netherlands Antilles national team for a long, long time. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't until uh, right around 1988 that the AVB kind of stepped in and put the Aruba national team together. Right now, things aren't so great. Uh, They did make a nice jump in the FIFA rankings that just came out. They jumped up four spots to number 201 in the world. Uh, So they're on their way up. Uh, The Aruba team, because of things you've seen in other nations where you have these dual nationals all over the place, I do want to point out one key player who has played for Aruba, but actually had a really good summer. Uh, Denzel Dumfries, who you might recognize from the Netherlands national team, he actually has caps with Aruba. Uh, Back in March 2014, he made his international debut for Aruba uh, in a friendly match against Guam. He actually played against Guam again a couple days later, scored a goal. So Denzel Dumfries, uh, one of the stars of the Euro 2020, actually has two caps for Aruba. Uh, most of their other players have plays. They play for local teams in Aruba. Uh, they do have some players applying their trade over in the Netherlands. Uh, a couple guys out of Germany. Back in World Cup qualifying uh, in June, they were able to get a 3-1 win over the Cayman Islands uh, before falling 7-0 to Canada. Uh, needless to say, they did not move on to the final round, uh, going 1-3 in their qualifying run this year. Uh, As far as Nations League goes, uh, they are getting relegated from League B to League C for the 2022-23 edition of the Nations League uh, after going 0-6 in in Group C of Division B in the 1920 Nations League. Uh, They've never made a Gold Cup, never made a World Cup. The program is building, 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 like all of these these island countries that we discuss on this podcast uh all-time appearance leader is Tarek ruiz uh he had 28 caps between 2004 and 2016 their all-time leading scorer is ronald gomez who at the tender age of 36 is still grinding for the national team he's got six goals in 20 over 21 caps from 2002 to now um at 36, he's still getting capped, and at six goals is the all-time leading scorer. A program that you'd like to say is on the rise in CONCACAF. Uh, the one other thing I want to talk about with, <laughs> with Aruba is Trinidad Stadium. Uh, Guillermo Prospero Trinidad Stadium is the home stadium for the Aruba national team. Uh, the name was changed in 1994. It was originally named after a Dutch queen. Uh, but it's their spot for soccer matches, and capacity is around 2,500 spectators. The one reason I want to talk about Trinidad Stadium here is because in 1997, Sinbad performed his HBO comedy special, Nothing But the Funk, 
at this stadium uh, <laughs> in Aruba. I remember this too. <laughs> so in classic CONCACAF fashion, maybe the most important thing to happen at your national stadium is Sinbad showing up and doing an HBO show. Uh, gentlemen, anything else we want to talk about with Aruba? No, it, it seems like this team uh, and this federation has a lot of work to do, and they're one of these beneficiaries of some of the changes that we've seen uh, with regards to qualification for the Gold Cup, qualifications for World Cup on both the men's and women's side. They're going to be one of these teams that hopefully gets more matches to develop their squads. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that. So hopefully we, we continue to see this team get better. Uh, I mean, I think we saw them make some progress in – uh, well, in Nations League, so I think definitely they're, they're a team that's on the up. All right, so that wraps up our laser focus. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with the CONCACAF Transfer Wire. All right, it's transfer season in soccer. Lots of stuff going on. So we're going to hit the most important things going on right now. It's the CONCACAF transfer wire. I'm going to go through, kind of read off some of these transactions. You guys can react as you see fit. First off, big move for Tyreek Tong of the Antigua and Barbuda International. He's moving from Hitachi Center SAPFC to UD Alba Arbo in Spain. Antigua and Barbuda is gang gang. So uh, shout out to Tonga and uh, hope that, transfer works out for him especially going to spain that's a step up in class uh for him uh, and it's i mean they're a small team but it's one where if he does well there maybe he gets picked up by uh, a segunda team next up we got pablo gallego the Ni nicaraguan uh he's moving from nicaragua side managua fc to zemplin mikolovs i think i got that right in the slovakian first tier uh Jonathan, thoughts on Gallego's big move? I mean, I think it's it's great as we're starting to see, you know, I think a lot of people listening uh, will find themselves, uh, you know, being aware of all the moves from, from U.S. and Mexico to Europe. But I think it's great to see other moves within the Confederation um, making their moves to, to teams uh, in Europe. All right. Next up, we've got Onel Hernandez, the Cuban international. This is actually a late-breaking move. Uh, he's going on loan. He's currently at Norwich in uh, the Premier League. He's going to Middlesbrough in the EFL Championship for a season-long loan. Uh, this is definitely geared to get him more playing time. Uh, and being at Norwich just making the move up to the Premier League and Middlesbrough still being uh, in the championship, I feel like this is one of those things where they're kind of viewing him as a championship player. Uh, and is going to make sure that he gets the playing time that he needs to develop. I mean, he is the only, I don't know, he at least was the first. He may not be the only uh, Cuban to play in the Premier League when he played um, the last time Norwich was up. Um, but, I mean, I, I hopefully he, go, he goes to Middlesbrough and, and performs well, then maybe uh, coming into next year, if Norwich stays up, he gets a, gets a chance to play in the Premier League. All right, moving on. Uh, we got an American... Gold Cup champion on the move, uh, Gianluca Busio, uh, the American moving from Sporting Kansas City to Venezia FC in Syria of Italy. I mean, I'm just going to say Venezia, um, while I do normally don't make this plea to non-CONCACAF countries, uh, but uh, send me some jerseys uh, <laughs> because uh, All Venezia, Venezia may have the freshest kids in Italy. Um, I mean, it'll be it's great to see uh, a young a young American getting a chance in Syria. It's just going to be a question of uh, Venezia is going to have their work cut out for them this year, um, staying up. So hopefully he gets a chance, you know, to develop and prove himself. He's joining a uh, fellow men's national team player, Tanner Tessman on the team. So we have two Americans. So uh, that means that Venezia should send double the amount of jerseys to us <laughs> um, because we have to have one, with Tessman and Busio in the back. That's just how that works. We, we don't discriminate between children, uh, but I think this is a good move because I think for one thing, Busio is going to get stronger by this learning from those uh, Syria offenses and learning how to basically be on a, on a field for that is only going to make him better. He's a young kid. So he's going to get uh, the chance to improve his game and make it where he can be one of the you know main forces 
uh, for the next decade for the United States. Yeah. The fee ranging about $6.6 .6 million U.S. Uh, with some add-ons in there as well. So good bit, but good bit of business for uh, Sporting Kansas City. Uh, next up, we've got Johan Vasquez, the Mexican international, going from Pumas to Genoa, the Serie A side on loan for the season. I would say, yeah. I mean, yeah, another great move. And like I said, I just, you know, reiterating the fact that uh, CONCACAF players um, seeing as being valuable uh, in Europe, I think is only a only a good thing. It makes it makes a world of difference, especially in Italy, where they have uh, rules on how many players you can bring in from outside of Italy, much less the European Union. So for them to use one of them on a CONCACAF player shows that they have a lot of confidence in that player uh, to make them, you know, make their squad whole. So uh, this is going to be a great move for him. It seems like he'll get a lot of opportunities there. All right, up next. We've got Costa Rican international Giancarlo Gonzalez uh, moving from LA Galaxy to Alajuense uh, back in Costa Rica on loan. Alajuela is a great, great team. They've been they've fallen off a little bit over the last couple of years, uh, but I will always rock with that crowd and that stadium. He is going to have a world of experience for that uh, for that team. And, and honestly, LDA is also featuring in. Uh, continentally, CONCACAF League, CONCACAF Nations League, or, or CONCACAF Champions League, they're involved in a lot of that. So they, he's going to have opportunities to play big matches for. And finally, on the men's side, uh, Joshua Frederick Charlery uh, from the Cayman Islands, moving on from Cayman side, Baden Town FC, to OTP in the Finland third tier. Jonathan, your reaction? Um, I, I'm going to be honest. I don't know much about the fin, the Finnish third tier. Um, but I mean, I, the biggest thing I can think of is man, that's going to be a, uh, temperature, a climate shock going from the Cayman islands to Finland. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Freddie do played in the third division of Finland for like, you know, 14 weeks or something like that. Yeah. I mean, that was one of his many stops. Um, I mean, we could do um just a, an entire series on on clubs that freddie adu found himself at uh but yeah I mean, there was already I a freddie adu podcast series grant wall did a good job with that yeah uh but i will say this uh for all you finnish fans out there if you're down with otp yeah you know me <laughs> perfect perfect way to wrap that up uh donald we also did have one late breaking move on the women's side you want to tell us about that yeah, literally, as we started recording, uh, you'll kind of know when we're recording when I say this information, but Abby Delkemper uh, for the U.S. Women's National Team is on the move within the NWSL. Uh, she was traded from the North Carolina Courage to the Houston Dash. Uh, the Dash will give away $25,000 in allocation money, along with some additional performance-based incentives to North Carolina. Uh, Dahlkemper, if you, as you all know, was with Manchester City last year. Uh, but her rights were held by the courage uh, because she had played with them before she left for Manchester City. She is not allocated. There is a new contract involved with this. Terms have not yet been disclosed on how long that contract is, but a, a very good get for the Dash in uh, to help solidify their defense. Happy to bring you that news right here on the podcast. So that wraps up our CONCAF transfer wire. Now that we've got all that actual soccer business, we got to get to the real important stuff here. It's time for real team or fake team. So our contestant. We <laughs> yeah, we, we need some like theme music. We need like a bed for this. Um, get that production value up. Uh, <laughs> this week's contestant, Donald. Donald, uh, this is your third time on the hot seat. I think so. Yeah. So it's a tough one. Jonathan and I are going to alternate giving you a Ruben soccer teams and you got to tell us if this is a real team or a fake team so jonathan you want to go first you want me to go first if you will go first i am pulling up my my list of teams as we speak okay a little on air little on air admin yeah you know what that's this is a work in progress listen if anyone thinks that we're being professional here they're wrong because we are not getting paid to do this we are super professional we're literally the definition of amateurs. <laughs> I don't know, Eric. I'm getting paid. Mm. Okay. Well, you better cut me in on that. <laughs> um, all right. So first team we got here, SV Deportivo Nacional. SV Deportivo Nacional. Um, 
You know what? I'm going to say, because I, because I know the history of the, of the country, I'm going to say that's real. That is a real team. Uh, Deportivo Nacional. Uh, they're in the division to honor. They actually won the 2021 Torneo AVB uh, 2021 Division of Honor uh, tournament uh, back in July. July 24th, they defeated La Fama 2-0 on late goals, an 88th-minute goal from Fladimi Francois and a 90-plus-2 goal from Edward Clarissa. Stealing that win late, uh, getting a trophy. So that's Deportivo Nacional. So down your you're one for team. one. My new favorite <laughs> Your team. new favorite team? Okay. Jonathan, you're up. Uh, SV Sports Boys. Uh, is it with a Y or uh, with a Z or an S? It is with an S. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ultimate CONCACAF question. Is it with yeah. an S or a Z? That, that ain't no Z, so I, I, I got to say it's fake. That is a real team. So um, they're in Division Uno in uh, tourne- the Torneo AVB 2021 division. They finished fourth in the regular stage in Pool B, but they did not qualify for the knockout rounds. Hmm. All right. So Donald, one for two. Next up, we've got SV Racing Club Aruba. SV Racing Club Aruba. Uh, since Sports Boys was real, I'm going to say that's real too. That is also real. Uh, they're in the division to honor. This is actually the powerhouse club. Uh, they are the 2020 and 2021 uh, Copa Libertador Betico Cross champs. Uh, back in April, uh, they had a 7 0 win over La Fama in the championship. Uh, and back when the 2020 season was suspended, they're actually leading division to honor in the standings. Uh, so that, that's the big club. SV Racing Club Aruba, that's your powerhouse. I love that team. All right. Next team, Santa Cruz Whiptail. Santa Cruz what? Whiptail. Like I whip a tail? Yes. Um. I can't even, I'm just going to say it's fake. I can't even pronounce that. It is fake. Um, I will say <laughs> that the whip tail is a reptile um, that has a very long tail that is um, predominantly found across the island. Uh, you tried to stump me with some actual, actual animals, man. <laughs> didn't, stump, didn't stump you good enough. <laughs> All right. So Donald, we're sitting at three for four. Uh, my last one is Independiente Porto Caravel. How do you spell Caravel? With a C or with a K? <laughs> with a C. C-A-R-A-V-E-L. Fake. That's fake. Oh, that's a real team. Damn. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're in the division to honor. I mean, they're not good, but they're there. So Look, they're fine. I, I, the two, I've missed the two that I've had to ask for spelling on. So that should let me know that I should just stop asking if, <laughs> if, if, if I how to spell it. All right. So last one to see if you can uh, match the high score held by both you and I and not Eric. Um, mm. So finally, SV Unistars. Is that one word or two? That is a single word. And it is an S and not a Z. Um, Are you giving them info? Can't. <laughs> Can I can can I, can you give me the Jaren? I, I feel like this is the spelling bee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Unistars. Mm-hmm. I I will say, I'll say this fake. That is a real team. Oh my so they God. are in Division Uno. Um, they finish third in the regular stage Pool A, uh, opposite pool of SV Sports Boys, um, but did not qualify for the knockout round. Mm. Three of six. Unistars. Yes. There's there's one. There's one. one. Yeah. It's a misnomer. <laughs> yeah. Donald struggling out here mm. in real team or fake team. Still, better I still hold Eric. the co-record, so I can hang my head on that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jonathan wasn't here for the last podcast. 
I'm pretty sure I had a good score. I did. I get. I got to go through and actually have like standings put together because I'm pretty sure I had a really good st- score last week when Jonathan wasn't here. That's true, but that doesn't count because he wasn't here. It, yes, it counts. <laughs> it, listen, the, this. Is, I decide if it counts <laughs> this, on this podcast. You may be the host, but you're third place in all of our hearts. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, that wraps up another thrilling edition, Real Team, Fake Team. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Donald. We're actually going to do something different this week. Uh, We're going to take a break, like a real break. Uh, We're going to put the World Cup qualifying talk on hold for a bit. We've got some other stuff we're going to do, but we're going to wrap up this episode right here. We're going to drop part two of this Aruba episode in a couple days. Uh, so in the meantime, follow us at Podcacaf, uh on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, like, re- rate, review, subscribe. Donald, what are your projects? Uh, the Stars and Stripes FC podcast. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at DW. Jonathan? Um, you can find me at JSlapeSSP um, or at Broadway Sports Media and Speedway Soccer. Yeah. So sorry to run on you, but we're going to keep this one short. We're going to save all the time we need for all of the World Cup qualifying talk uh, right before our September window. So we'll be back shortly. Not right now, but shortly. And thanks for listening.